Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, all. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. If you can please uh, say hello in the chat, let us know where you're dialing in from. I'd love to see that. Uh, Tamash, my live stream is just hanging. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, you want to make me a host and I can see if I can do it? Mm -hmm. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. We'll get started in a little bit, a uh, couple of minutes as we start the live stream. Thank you for joining us today. Please uh, say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're calling in from. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. We're going to give everyone a couple more minutes to join us today. Um, if you are uh, on the Zoom already, please let us know where you're uh, calling from. Let's see here. Hi, Alfonso from Mexico. Always good to see you here. We got some folks from Brussels, Matthias, Shane, of course, and Robbie, and India. Good morning or good evening. And New York City. Well, New York. <laughs> Good to see everyone this morning. Uh, once again, if you can just get started, uh, we'll get started in a couple minutes. Tomas, let me know. Yeah, mine is also hanging. Just uh, trying to see if I can put it on YouTube. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. We are just trying to get the live stream going. If you can give us one more minute, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us. If you have just joined, um, say hello from uh, in the chat. Um, a couple of us uh, let you know we're here from Mexico and Brussels and New York, uh, India, and New York uh, as well. So say hello. Let us know where you're zooming in from this morning, this afternoon, or this evening. Hey, Jim, good to see you from Maine.
Tomas, should I go and, oh, Tomas just left. All right, we're just having a little bit of trouble with the live stream. Tomas is gonna log back in and see if he can get that going. You wanna try that again, Tomas? Yes, could you give me a host again? Just to see if I can do that. Okay. We're trying a new live stream service. Mm. Hello, everyone. Once again, we all get started in one minute. Thank you for joining us today for the Hyperledger member in-depth deploying and hosting EPC nodes based on Hyperledger base. So I'm really excited about this session today. We're just looking to see if we can start the live stream. We are having some technical issues. Meanwhile, um, if you have not already said hello on the webinar chat, let us know where you're Zooming in from. We got folks from Brussels and we have folks from New York and uh, San Francisco where I am, India, uh, Mexico. It's a great crowd this morning. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Tomas, should we just go ahead and... Yes, I think we should just go ahead and then we'll post the YouTube recording uh, later on. I'll see if I can try to get it working in the meantime. Okay, great. If you can make me a co-host as well so I can have access yeah. to you. Of course. Good. All right. Excellent. Let me go ahead and turn on my video. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Daniela Barbosa. I am the executive director of the Hyperledger Foundation, and I'm so pleased to be hosting uh, this morning's uh, member in-depth webinar with House University of Applied Sciences. Uh, today's session is, gonna, is called Deploying and Hosting EPSI Nodes Based on Hyperledger Beizu. But before we get started, I want to just do a couple of house cleaning, cleaning items. Um, as we all know, all are welcome in the Hyperledger community, and we really aim aim to have a safe and welcoming community for all to participate in. We encourage you to use the chat to ask questions and ask comments. We encourage you to use the Q&A buttons as well, but please be respectful of one another and do reference the Hyperledger Code of Contract conduct if you have any questions. A couple other housekeeping rules, all Linux Foundation meetings that involve participation by industry competitors are held under the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. So we thank you in advance for meeting those requirements. Uh, all of our sessions are always recording and this session is recorded and will be available in our webinar library as well as our YouTube library where you can see the recordings from previous sessions as well. And the slides Slides will be available for downloads as well in the video description of the webinar. Please, this is about you getting the most out of it and you understanding what we're doing. So please feel free to raise your hand at the end. We'll have time for some, if we have time, some questions, we'll uh, let you do a voice question. You can always ask questions in the Q&A button on your Zoom meeting. Click on the Q&A button, ask your question. We'll either ask the, answer them live or uh, via type in the Q&A box as well. And of course, talk and comment. And once again, if you just joined us, uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. Let us know where you're all dialing in from. It is a pleasure to see everybody here today. Um, I, as I said, I'm Daniela Barbosa. I'm the executive director of the Hyperledger Foundation. And I really have the honor of leading our global ecosystem and community worldwide that is using Hyperledger technologies um, to build efficiencies in markets, to bring uh, financial inclusions to markets, and to really make our digital world uh, an easier, safer place to be. And today's session around deploying and hosting Epstein modes based on Hyperledger Beisu is certainly one of them. And one of the things I'm most excited about as Hyperledger Foundation, we're just celebrating our eighth year anniversary uh, this year, is really about the breadth of blockchain projects that we have at the Hyperledger Foundation, and very importantly, the breadth of blockchain projects that implementations, whether it's companies in a retail space and financial services space, or governments like we're going to learn about today, um, are really adopting really the spectrum of blockchains for today's. And then the Hyperledger Foundation and our umbrella of projects, today we have 13 different projects, we're really addressing a lot of these needs, and that it's not one size fits all. It, we have permissioned and 
and permissionless uh, blockchain projects within our community, addressing both public and private. And these hybrid models of, uh, of having basically a public layer one with permissioned governance on, on it as well. And I'm very excited about the, the, the uh, opportunities that we see and that we've seen roll out throughout the world, specifically around public permission networks. Um, and today we're going to hear about EPSI, which is the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure. It started in 2018 with 29 different countries uh, and the European Commission coming together and realizing that there was power to build a public utility blockchain for the European Union. We've seen other projects, for example, in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, led by the Inter-American Development Bank with LACChain, LACnet, um, that are also building these public permission networks. So essentially, layer one public uh, blockchains that are utilities for governments, for businesses, and for individuals in those regions as well. And the latest one is Red Blockchain Brazil, which is obviously based out of Brazil and also uh, with the goal of having permission, uh, permi uh, public permission networks for, as a utility for Brazil. All these are very excitedly built on Hyperledger Besu, which is one of our projects that has been in the foundation since 2019 and is being used both as a public uh, Ethereum mainnet execution client. Uh, today, about 13% of mainnet actually runs Hyperledger Bezu as an execution client. And it's also being run as an Ethereum virtual machine permission blockchain on many, many blockchain uh, uh, platforms uh, in the world, especially around in uh, financial services. But today we're going to hear about EPSI um, and essentially how to go about deploying and hosting EPSI nodes uh, based on Hyperledger Bezu. So I'd like to welcome Shane DeConnick. Um, who is the Web3 lead at House University of Applied Sciences, and Robbie Gottnick, who's the security researcher and Web3 engineer at House University of Applied Sciences as well. It's been a pleasure to meet both of them in person at some of our member events, um, and I'm very excited about today's session. So Shane, um, Robbie, over to you. You can go ahead and turn on your video. Yes. Thank Good you, afternoon. Dr. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay. You can see the screen well, I guess. Looks great. Let's get started. All right. So thank you for joining uh, the webinar that we're delivering. So I just try to get the slides going. So I'm Shane de Koning. I'm the Web3 Lead at Hoest University of Applied Sciences. And I will let Robbie introduce himself. Yeah, my name is Robbie, and I'm an infrastructure and Web3 engineer at the Hoest University, um, mainly technical stuff. I will just very briefly explain what Hoest is. So we are a University of Applied Sciences in Belgium. We have campuses in Bruges, in Kortrijk, and in Oudenaarde. We offer a, a wide breadth of bachelor programs, social degrees, and postgraduates. Um, we are more and more also focusing on lifelong learning. And our research is applied. So we don't do fundamental research. And I will tell later a bit more about the quadruple helix. And we have beautiful campuses. So if you're ever nearby or you want to visit, you're always welcome. More specifically, we are part of the Cyber Tree Lab team, and we are connected to the educational program of uh, Applied Computer Science. And what we want to do, we want to empower SMEs and citizens through cutting edge, cutting edge research and innovation in Web3, AI, cybersecurity, and immersive technologies. And that's a very exciting environment to be in because it's often when you make the combinations that it really becomes interesting. What do we do? Um, we nurture talent. I think it's a more beautiful way to describe education. Talent comes to us, we share what we know, and they, they leave richer. We also compose consortia for um, research projects. We build proof of concepts. We never make anything that runs in production. That's up to the industry. And the big thing we do, and that's also why we're here to share knowledge about EPSI, is to raise awareness about possibilities. And this quadruple helix, I think it's a great thing. So what we want to do, we bring together academia, government, industry, and community. And I think we are in a great position 
as an independent organization. Our definition of Web3, I believe it's also important as there are many definitions. We keep it very broad. For us, it's addressing power imbalances and limitations that are inherent in Web2 technologies. So this is about DLTs, but also we're looking at decentralized storage, such as Solid, and decentralized identity and ownership. Um, what we offer is we offer education, we offer bachelor, master classes, postgraduate degree, we do applied research, we offer, we offer services, and we also organize events. So we host uh, currently the Hyperledger Belgium meetup. So also, also a warm recommendation to come. And every day, every year, sorry, we host a decentralized autonomous hackathon that's being run through smart contracts. And then the last slide about the West, and then we will shift to EPSI. Um, we are not part of the organizational team of EPSI, but we have been already very early involved within projects. So we implemented two uh, early adopter projects in collaboration with KBC Bank, which is a Belgian bank. We are pi pioneering in issuing digital student cards through verifiable credentials. And together with Belnet, we are um, in the process of becoming a node operator within EPSI. So it's through this experience that now we will shift to a slide deck that is mainly coming from EPSI, where we will explain what is EPSI, and then we will also go more technical. So the main challenge, um, that actually with EPSI they, they are trying to solve and we are trying to solve is to, to combat uh, fake products or fake information and to make the verification much easier and also in a more privacy preserving way. So as you can see in 2020, 9% of EU co consumers were tricked into buying a fake product. 33% wondered if the product they bought was real or fake, and about 6% of imports are attributed, attributed to counterfeit or pirated goods. Next to this, another example, there, there could be, I think, thousands of slides with examples, is that, um, that nearly 60% of hiring managers reported uh, fabrications on resumes, because it's hard to verify. And if you need to replace an employee, it's also very costly. So these are just two examples to stress that verifying information, it's, it's not a luxury problem, it's very important. And if you want to combat fake, you need to verify. So we have an example to make it more tangible. Um, my colleague Robbie studied applied computer science at Hoest, but at least he can claim that, but how can I verify it? First thing I could do, I could Google Robbie, go to his LinkedIn, and I could see that Robbie claims that he studied at Hoest. But I can also claim that I have a PhD from Harvard, which probably is not true. It's easy to add on LinkedIn. Next, if you want to be more sure, um, I could ask Robbie to scan his degree or the di digital version and send it as a PDF. Then it will already be a bit harder to counterfeit. I have story I have heard stories where they ask with a pencil, like if you have an embossed stamp to go over it a bit so that you can see the stamp, but that's that's being medieval within the digital, so that's not good. And also it's already slower to get it. You can also ask the paper diploma, but then you will have to go bring it and still you, ha you will have to know what it really looks like. Or you could contact uh, Robbie's university or where, where alma mater, and but then actually it will be really slow. So, but within EPSI, they, are, they achieve is that actually they want the highest trust of asking to host to make it really fast and in a privacy-preserving way. So that actually through 
a signed verifiable credential within a digital wallet. You can ask a presentation. You don't need to ask to host. And you can immediately verify or even automate uh, to check if Robbie really owns this degree. And this is being done. We will go in much more detail about this. But this is being done also through um, a trusted list of issuers where the public keys and accred accreditation information can be queried from the blockchain so that you can verify the signature. And then here, those familiar with SSI, this will be nothing new. For those who are new to SSI, and SSI stands for Cell Sovereign Identity, there's, if you understand this picture, if you can wrap your mind around this, then the rest will be very easy. So what you have, um, also in traditional things, you have it. You have an issuer, for example, who rests, issues a credential that uh, Robbie has a degree. And then the holder, Robbie, has it, stores it in, the di in its digital wallet. This credential also is not on the blockchain. That's very important. The verifiable credential is sent by Hovest to Robby, and only Robby holds it. Because often people think that all, all information is stored on a blockchain. And as we all know, uh, with privacy issues, you cannot erase anything from a blockchain. So it's not a good idea. And then what Robby can do, for example, if I want to hire Robby, I want to check if he really has this degree, Robby can make a presentation. And he doesn't need to even share all the information on his credential. He can just, the claims he wants to share, he can select them. And it's out of scope of this presentation, but very shortly, you can also do zero knowledge proofs, which are even more exciting. If I want to present to someone uh, that I earn more than a certain income level to apply for a loan, I can just prove yes. And they don't need to know if I earn $1 more or a thousand or whatever. And so where does the blockchain come in? As I said before, it's here at the bottom. So you have a public keys of the issuers, which in blockchain always comes back. So you have public private key, the issuer signs with their private key. And when you when you know the public key, you can verify that indeed this was signed by that, by that private key. Also, there's a register of issuers. That's where the public permission comes in, why this is so important and powerful here. The Ministry of Education in Belgium, they can actually accredit that Hoest is university, or they can even put the organization in between and say that that organization can then claim which are universities, so that there's not a random Hovest, uh, a copy of Hovest also coming, and that you need to check is it really Hovest or not. And then also they are working on uh, revocation mechanisms, mechanisms in case there was a fraud or anything and the credential is no longer valid, that also this can be checked. All right. Um, so FC has established a multi-domain multi trust infrastructure. So they provide services that everyone can trust. They contribute to data spaces within Europe or European Union. This is a very important uh, thing on the on the agenda that actually they want to combat data monopolies. And uh, the last one, but also important, because this is organized through a governmental body as European Union, it's in line with the values and regulations. So it's a lot easier for local governments or companies to, to actually start adopting. They don't need to go through all the checks if uh, juridically, if it's okay or not. Because verifiable credentials are so flexible, they can be used almost in every sector. You, me as an issuer, I, uh, I put claims, I sign it and I give it. And whatever is in this claim, it can be very broad. 
And currently there are lots of use cases because having a great ID is one thing, but to get the adoption going and also to, to learn together which services there should be, which credential format there should be, that's where actually all these current projects come in. And as you can see with the West, we are here this small one, but there's uh, plenty of projects. Here are some of the projects that are going. So um, between Greece and Switzerland, there's a project where the formal accreditation is done through verifiable credentials. So that's much easier if a Greek student goes to Switzerland or vice versa to, to approve this. Then also my, my academic ID, that's more about the student ID that also this is more easily verified between Spain, Romania, and Ireland. And they're more um, like these are all about education, actually consortia doing things to make easier. And then I can give some more examples. So next to education, there are public services where they here um, in Spain, they are trying to get a lot of the administrative processes between governments, which I think many of us will have experienced within their uh, life can be very, very hard to, to bring papers from one service to the other to make that more streamlined. This is about um, IP and actually information sharing between supply chain. Here, there's a, a, a wallet for students. This project's ESS pass is about social rights. So, yeah, you can see our social security, you can see there's uh, a wide breadth of projects and there's even many more pilots going on. So what does EPSI encompass? So it's not only uh, DIDs where you can, or decentralized identifiers where you can uh, ask for the public key. There's more involved as I already uh, explain a bit. So there's the the framework of how should verifi verifiable credentials be exchanged and the wallets that are being made need to actually be compliant with that method. There's uh, the trust models. So um, for issuers and for verifiers, there's a revocation framework. Then there are interoperable wallets. So there, there's no such thing as the EPSI wallets. It's open to the market, to the industry, to develop uh, wallets that are compliant, but also that are interoperable. And that's a big thing. And then here um, you have decentralized infrastructure for trusted registries. It's the last one I will present before I give the word to uh, Robbie. So here at the bottom, Actually, you can see what EPSI provides. They provide uh, a ledger and they provide APIs. So all these independent nodes. So every, like every member country within the consortium of EPSI uh, provides own nodes. So in that sense, uh, in Europe, it's being decentralized across countries. And then there's APIs that are provided. So that make it easier to, to query them. Then here, um, together with the markets, with the, with the users, the verifiable credentials profile is developed based on the W3C standards. And then when you go a layer more above, there is where the market comes in. So wallets are being developed independently. If you are in the market, you can also develop one. They have online tools so that you can actually check if it's being compliant. And then if it's compliant, it can be on the market. And then here you see use cases such as education, social security, et cetera. And within each of these use cases, then um, yeah, you have issuer, holder, verifier, and TAO. Okay. All right, thank you, Shane. Um, I think you skipped a, a slide. Yeah, I'm sorry. I messed up. It's a bit slow. Follow. 
All right. So the philosophy of EPSI is a project about decentralization. Uh, it's because we try, well, I say we, uh, but it's the EPSI program. Uh, uh, we're just adopters of it. Uh, but we're trying to add the uh, value for our users of being the citizens in the EU uh, economic area. Uh, for that reason, EPSI is using a decentralized network because so far the, the distributed ledger technologies have had a key role and are the best technology uh, to implement trusted registries that can be reused as trusted lists. Uh, blockchain is only used where it makes sense uh, due to the strengths of its immutability, tamper evidence, and decentralization. Uh, as Shane already mentioned, we don't put the actual personal data on chain. Yes, next slide. Um, we want to make uh, the adoption as easy as possible and have a good integration with applications. Um, so the, the program, we're well aware that not everyone is, speaks the language of blockchain. Not everyone speaks the RPCs uh, of uh, Bezu. So um, all interaction with the ledger happens to deploy business domain governments, to onboard issuers or uh, attestation providers, uh, verifiers and relying parties, to register information for verification and obtain information for to verify digital credentials. All of this happens through the use of APIs. Uh, this is very similar to what most uh, programs already know. Uh, if you want to play around with these APIs, they actually offer a open set of it. Um, the link that you see in the screenshot is no longer active because that's from the pilot. Uh, if you want to get an updated one, there's plenty of documentation online if you look up EPSI. So this is because they don't finish in drafting those specifications and providing the HTTPAs, HTTP APIs. Uh, but also to allow for everyone to, to mess around with it, basically. So um, why do we use ledgers and not just the trusted list trademark? Um, the short answer is no, but we'll go a little bit more in depth here. So the situation today is that the government is using uh, a distributed static XML file. So these are XML files that were defined uh, in 2015, and they currently have an implementation of trusted lists. Uh, each EU member has a copy of it, basically. If we want to uh, find a hybrid approach, we're going to go towards a distributed database. Uh, business requirements and security properties can be added to enhance the model such as synchronization, replication, traceability, and accountability. Ultimately, when we push forward, we end up with distributed ledger technologies, uh, such as the case is with EPSI. The current existing uh, XML files, they provide uh, integrity, authenticity, proof of existence. That's the current implementation. The hybrid approach with a distributed database uh, adds on to that the distribution and replication of uh, these documents, the resilience of a uh, yeah, distributed database network, and the high performance, low latency. When we look at distributed ledger technologies, what we see also here is the accountability. Like if you know blockchain, you know that every transaction it gets recorded uh, if someone changes something when the keys rotate, etc. It also is a chronological set of data records and access management uh, provided, is provided in an accountable way and incorporated to the protocol. Information cannot be deleted, can only be appended. So you cannot even, you can alter it, but only through appending. Uh, this provides some integrity and tamper-proof protection uh, as well as a decentralization aspect uh, because there's no single node. So 
I'm sorry. You wanted Sorry, to add that's something? all right. Uh, the collective truth. Um, yeah. The new information is agreed upon by consensus between the nodes, which decentralizes the truth and everyone has a way of accessing it. All these nodes, as you well know, uh, they all share the same ledger. As I mentioned before, there are no rewrites and the data is added chronologically. Uh, this is append only through to its innate cryptographic properties. Uh, all blocks reference previous blocks. And there's a resilience to bad faith actors. So even if one of those node operators, uh, they go rogue, uh, the collective truth still persists. Uh, blockchain prevents lies from taking hold because there's no single point of failure. Uh, the infrastructure is resilient and resistant to cyber attacks. Um, we've mentioned trusted list a couple of times now. Uh, when we mention a TAO, this is a trusted accreditation organization. Every member state has infrastructure for education, uh, for banks, uh, uh, for uh, the real estate sector, let's say. And each of these fields, they can have a TAO within a member organization. These uh, trusted accreditation organizations can issue a verifiable accreditation to a trusted issuer, the TI on the left side. The trusted issuer is, has a DID, which is registered on the EPSI blockchain. These, from this DID, there are a couple of sets of DID keys, which can be uh, rolled uh, or revoked uh, if necessary. These e-signatures or e-seals ensure authenticity, integrity, and non-repudiation. Uh, Timestamps ensure the proof of existence, but importantly, ledgers provide immutability. Uh, it ensures that the information cannot be removed or modified. Ledgers provide a chronological sequence that ensures verification of data in the past. The PKI, distributed PKI, uh, implies that if a key is compromised, uh, issuers uh, minimize the impact as less verifiable credentials will be signed with the same key. The key rotation still uh, links back to the same DID, a decentralized identifier, uh, in case that is not clear for everyone. So we're going to talk about a little bit about the onboarding process now. It consists of uh, five major steps, which we will go into each of them now. So the first step is to get endorsement from a European blockchain project representative. I'm not sure about the acronym, but... Uh... Yeah, I think it's partnership. Uh -huh. So, first of all, you want to have a security endorsement before you go to your e EBP representative. Uh, this means that you have to have, a, if you want to run a node in pre-production or production, you need to supply a I ISO 27001 uh, certificate or something similar uh, like NIST will also do, for example. Uh, the EBP representative will verify it and endorse it. Of course, they are a little bit flexible. Uh, if you cannot uh, obtain a certificate before deploying the node, you can also go ahead with uh, the node installation and then later get the certification before you can connect to the network. So once you have the uh, certification ready, you can go ahead and create a new node request ticket. Uh, they provide a simple Jira service desk website for this, uh, where you can uh, fill out a form, which will create a new ticket for the uh, EPSI support office. They're a big uh, part of this uh, whole process. And you have to upload your endorsement and if available, the security endorsement. Uh, you'll be signing we will be asked to sign a relevant legal package regarding SLAs. And once validated, you will be granted access to the node documentation and community.
third and maybe somewhat well very important uh, when you're going in depth uh, you have to meet or exceed the hardware requirements set out in the minimal uh, so you can either host the node uh, in the cloud or on-prem uh, it is recommended though that you stay within your uh, member state uh, so we as hosts we, we are located in belgium we are uh, host we will be hosting our node within the territory of belgium there is one dedicated virtual machine per uh, environment and they have a certain set of uh, requirements So in order to maintain a healthy network, it is crucial to follow some network requirements. That means we have to have uh, one public IPv4 address uh, per environment. So if you're running both pre-production and production, you have to have uh, a separate IPv4 address for those environments. If you're running multiple production nodes, then you also need multiple IPv IPv4 addresses for those. The nodes have to have unrestricted outbound connections to the internet. And there's a couple of inbound rules that you have to allow uh, 443 for the APIs and then some uh, TCP and UDP port for the Bezu peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Very important as part of the security requirement is that you have a web application firewall. Uh, this adds a couple, another layer to the security of our node to help us protect, uh, protect it against uh, distributed denial of service attacks, but also SQL or other XSS uh, attacks, which are uh, very uh, common actually on, on public uh, uh, interfaces. Uh, we can choose which, whichever WAF we can uh, want uh, or whichever is available. The rules that we should have in place, uh, the slide here is a little bit outdated. Uh, we recently, it was decided that uh, it is recommended to have a whitelist of uh, requests. Um, so it's getting stricter and stricter as we are approaching production launch. The software itself, uh, the node itself, will be supplied to you by the support office in an image. Uh, there are a couple of formats like KVM, VHD, VMDK, VMware, so you can run it on almost any environment that you can think of. And there's, a, of course, a couple of steps involved. You have to download it uh, and then mount the image. Uh, the support office will provide you with a login, which is a username and password, which you are forced to change, obviously. And then to configure it, you will run a script, which will ask a couple of questions like DNS, domain name, uh, whether SSL is enabled, etc. Uh, the documentation that provided by EPSI will clear up any details. Uh, as mentioned, the SSL certificate. Also here, you have a lot of choice. You can either use a Let's Encrypt automated certificate, which is bundled in the node itself. We can uh, request a certificate uh, from a registrar, uh, or we can actually manage it through a reverse proxy. Also either by Let's Encrypt or a, a, a purchased uh, certificate. Once you completed the installation, uh, you will inform the support office and they will run a couple of verification steps to check if you meet the minimum specifications, whether your node is connected and has access to the other nodes, and whether all the containers within the instances are installed and behaving as expected. Once you're fully installed, uh, you can now start uh, the contacting the support office and they will add your node to the whitelist. The whitelist is dis distributed between all nodes, so they know they can contact you and you can start syncing your blockchain. It will see that uh, it needs to perform the sync and once it is completed, you are now fully up and running. The node onboarding is complete.
well, the onboarding may be complete, but uh, after you've completed the onboarding and the installation, you have to actually monitor the, the node itself. This is because the node itself, it contains a couple of containers which will push metrics to the support office. And you've signed a SLA to join the network. So you have to have a, uh, a maximum time to resolve TTR, uh, to resolve any issues like downtime, etc. cetera. Uh, you will also be provided with a login to the Grafana dashboards uh, by the support office. So you can, uh, it's recommended that you actually monitor these uh, actively. Under the hood, well, you may already know it, it's Bezu, um, but we'll go a little bit more in depth here. Um, so when you have your distributed applications or wallets, they can connect either directly to a node, as you can see on the left, without a load balancer. They can use private load balancers that connect to a couple of nodes, uh, but there is also a public load balancer hosted by the European Council. Uh, and all of these, yeah, uh, are connected. Uh, inside the node, so, well, not inside the node yet. Uh, each node operator hosts their node in a data center on the hypervisor. Uh, you have to provide the firewall yourself, and preferably it's recommended to have a reverse proxy in between your firewall and uh, with web application firewall as well uh, to the VM of the EPSI image. Uh, on the EPSI image, in the next slide, you will see uh, that there's a couple of containers running, such as uh, the traffic, uh, which is also a reverse proxy within the node itself. Uh, that has a couple of APIs, such as the Ledger APIs and, of course, the Hyperledger Bezo node, uh, or container, anyway. Uh, they come as an all-in-one uh, application, so all of this you don't have to configure. This is part of the virtual image that is being supplied by the support office. And all of the, the, the connections to the container logs, orchestrator, EC monitoring, uh, with the Grafana dashboards, as we mentioned before, all of this is part of the package. Um, and to sync it, it will use the port 48733 to connect to other nodes through the allow list. So I think that was about it. Um, of course, this is still very high level. Uh, if you or people in the chat have more questions for us, you can always reach out. You can ask it in the chat. Uh, our emails and names are displayed here, but you can also find us on LinkedIn. And I'm sure that people from Hyperledger will also be happy to direct you to our contacts if necessary. Yes, and I've already seen a lot of great questions in the chat. However, I don't know the answer to all of it. Um, we are involved in EPSI to, for those who joined later. As university, we are involved in deploying use cases and also in hosting a node. So I'm not up to date about the, the number of nodes or the, no, the number of, um, uh, how should I say, the number of nodes or the number of projects. I can, uh, however, say that uh, EPSI, the organization, is going through a next phase where it's re renamed to Europium, where I think there's eight to nine countries in the consortium now, but there's still nodes still in many countries. If you have been contacted, um, of, if you contacted EPSI to host a note and you didn't get an answer, um, I can, yeah, I can also try to see in my network with them to to bump your message. However, the I think within this public permission system, I don't think, but maybe Robbie knows more about it. I don't think the ambition is to have um, many people or individuals or whatever hosting notes. It's quite careful process. Yeah, this is why we have the, the onboarding uh, process with the ISO certification, 
Uh, you have to go through uh, EBP representative, etc. cetera. Um, so they don't just allow, that's why it's a permission network uh, and, and they provide the permissions through these means as well. Uh, they want to verify who you are before you can just up and run a node. The, the, the cases the, as such that you as a user or a citizen or a developer of uh, decentralized applications, you can still access those APIs, uh, but you will not be running your own node. Um, yeah, and to get in touch with the FC team or to find more information, uh, as Daniela just uh, shared the, the address, it's hub.epsi.eu, and there you can actually find uh, the overview how to get in touch with them. All right, I'm going through the questions a little bit. Uh, so we had the question like, what are the distributed databases used for off-chain data? Uh, the distributed databases, they're like an intermediary step. So we were coming from the static XML files where a list of universities or uh, real estate or uh, visual systems are registered. Um, the hybrid database is a uh, uh, the distributed database is a hybrid approach, that, which is a step towards the distributed ledger technology of EPSI. Um, I hope that answers one question. Is there a working relationship between EPSI and the uh, DIDCOM hyperledger stack? This is also one that I don't know exactly. Zero knowledge proofs are currently uh, not yet used, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I don't know. I answered all the questions. I know the, the answer. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm, going, I'm going through them uh, because I didn't see them as I was uh, uh, doing my part of the presentation. Um, the censorship power, it's a good question. Um, like we mentioned that uh, there is an allow list. So if you as a node operator would would go rogue between quotes, uh, you can be removed from that allow list. Um, but this is because this is a very sensitive uh, governmental top-down project. Uh, so you have to find a little bit of balance between trusting your government, etc. It's definitely not a fully decentralized um, permissionless blockchain uh, as we see in the uh, as we see uh, in the in the public space. How many nodes are there now in EPSI production? Uh, the EPSI production net is launching uh, very soon. It's uh, currently not yet up and running. We're preparing to go pub, uh, to launch it. Uh, I think it was April. There will be a first wave of 20 node operators throughout uh, the, the uh, consortium. Um, but there is a second phase in which more will join by November. And I think, I think after that, it will become more and more open to the public uh, for private organizations uh, to also join the, the consortium. Okay, I'm just trying to move the ones that we answered off of the list. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, um, of course, I, I'm not sure about all of them. So the zero knowledge proofs, we don't really know at this point. Um, are there also images to run in Kubernetes? Um, that's a very good question. I love Kubernetes. Uh, I wish they would have it, but I don't think they have it at the moment. Um, but I think if enough questions come, then they will also maybe develop this. I, I cannot promise this. Uh, uh, I don't want to speak for them. Um, 
but I would also love this. Uh, Robbie, did you can, answer can, the Bezu version question? The Bezu version. Oof. Um, I don't know the exact version number that we're using. I think um, it is in the EPSI hub documentation, though. I'm trying yeah. to find the page. So um, if you uh, go to the EPSI hub documentation, the requirements are listed there. Um, can any app to connect to an EPSI node and are the nodes public to ping? Um, the firewall is such that it only allows, uh, well, you can, you can always tell net a, a public port, um, but we are only allowing 443 and, uh, HTTPS in other words, as well as the Bezu peer to peer protocol on port 48733. Um, but any app that's compliant, that speaks the language, is able to connect to it. Of course, if you try to send uh, requests that, are, that don't get validated by the WAF, the web application firewall, uh, these will also be disconnected, the connections. Will, it, will that be possible to run read-only nodes to validate trusted issuers without going through a third-party site? Um, as of now, I don't know this, but um, I would like to see that as well, uh, so that you can co download a copy of the blockchain without actually being a validator node. Okay, there were some questions around workload and transactions. Did you say that was not, you didn't have those data points? No, I don't have those data points. Um, I think, uh, well, I think current block time uh, on the test net, on the pilot net is a couple of seconds. Uh, but transaction latency range, uh, I don't know, sorry. Uh, no, I think the number of transactions per second is also answered by that. Every couple of seconds, you have a, a block. Uh, the, the, no, the number of transactions itself will not be that big, actually. Because we don't want to store any data on chain, it's mostly just a registry. Uh, so we register the issuers, uh, we register the trusted verifiers, but this itself does not change that frequently that you have a load of transactions every block. Okay. Right. I think we've gone through most of them. Um, I do have a question. Um, have either of you gone to the FC Experience Center in Belgium? No, uh, I, I'm really hoping that we can go do this uh, very shortly with, it, with the entire team so they can also experience it. Excellent. Yeah, it looks like yeah. a great place. I think that's um, a great about this project. It's a really also inspiring member states and Europe about what blockchain can be because there's so many misconceptions about blockchain. So I think having this experience center explaining what's so powerful, working with verifiable credentials instead of having always the phone home, having all these silos uh, across countries I think yeah, that's also powerful that's why in this presentation it's not that technical this presentation and I think it's like design patterns are discovered for some contexts that, that it can be powerful and as Daniela said the world is multi-chain so I, I see a question about privacy and developing a new consensus protocol I don't fully understand the, the question, but I think here EPSI is really, um, as Robbie said, about trade-offs, that it's less, it's not permissionless. You cannot just run your own node yourself and there's more trust involved. Excellent. And we'll take a look through the questions and post them as well in the webinar library when we finish those up.
Um, Shane, Robbie, thank you so much for the session today. Very, uh, very helpful. And I think, you know, as EPSI continues to have more adoptions and use cases, uh, we'll have more of these sessions because people want to understand how it works, um, want to understand how they can get involved um, and, you know, really understand the, in as these things go into production, the value that it's bringing to the European Union. So thank you, um, as always, for leading the way um, and presenting the session today. So thank you so much. Um, and Shane and Robbie can be contacted via LinkedIn, I believe. Uh, if you are interested in reaching out, please do reach out to them as well. Um, and they would be happy to answer your questions. Um, just as a reminder, um, we have these ongoing uh, in-depth webinars with our member community, as well as many, many other events, either in person or uh, via virtual channels that you can learn about the Hyperledger Foundation. You can learn about the projects and the code projects within the foundation. And obviously you can learn about the use cases worldwide as well. So we encourage you to check out our events page for upcoming events that we are either in person or virtual uh, bringing to the ecosystem. Uh, just a couple of things that are upcoming that I thought would be great. Uh, coming up right after this session, so it starts in one minute, is uh, via the meetup um, community, the impact of Mika and data regulations on blockchain networks. So that is on our meetup page. Um, and if you go to our website, you can jump on that session. It'll be live streamed as well. Hopefully, if the live stream is working uh, for the 9 a.m. session as well. So uh, the Impact Amica is coming up. Uh, we also have uh, uh, our newest project, Web3J, Hyperledger Web3J. Uh, we have an in, uh, all uh, hands-on workshop coming up on March 28th. Um, and that is going to, once again, be a multi-hour uh, workshop hands-on for our newest project, Hyperledger Web3J. Um, March is uh, women, uh, Women's Month, and the Hyperledger India chapter will be having Women in Blockchain series, uh, which are great opportunities uh, to really learn about women who are leading uh, the blockchain industry worldwide um, and engineering talent that, that is really bringing uh, next level uh, development into the marketplace. Um, and last but not least, uh, a very popular subject on uh, zero knowledge proofs. We'll be having uh, a ZK programming blockchain application development workshop as well. Um, and that will happen in April. All of those are available once again via our events website and on the wiki as well. Uh, keep in mind, uh, we have many other content that we produce from our community. Uh, we just launched our um, second version of our central bank digital currency ebook, uh, with which has a lot of new applications in the CBDC space. Um, please join our Discord. Our Discord is open for anyone to participate in. And you can deep dive into the projects themselves, working groups, regional chapters, special interests, and more. So please join us on our Discord and uh, feel free to find me there as well. So uh, we are a member-run organization, so I want to thank all the members that support our global community worldwide and encourage you to take a look at how your company can also support the Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, please uh, send us an email via membership at hyperledger.org. Uh, reach out to me, and I'm happy to jump on a call. Uh, but we really appreciate the existing members that have supported us for the last eight years um, in really making sure that we can bring these kind of valuable um, uh, programs to the market. So thank you for watching. Uh, please watch our next uh, meetups and next communities. And I wish everyone a good uh, rest of your day. Thank you.